something like $500 million in that theater fund as of January of 2008. There apparently are internal memos going back and forth from Chase employees saying there's something wrong here. And they started withdrawing money from their accounts. By the time Madoff was arrested, their account was down to about $30 million. And they were a net winner of about $300 million in total. Mm -hmm. The CEO of Chase has said he never heard about any of this thing until Bernard Madoff was arrested. I'm going to cover this in more detail later. However, in this 703 account handling $80 billion, there are checks coming in as investor deposits into this account. There are also checks going out of the 703 account for investor withdrawals. $80 billion in and after. Mm -hmm. JP Morgan Chase has an IA investment account. And if you had an IA investment account, you should have expected to see checks going back and forth mm -hmm. for trading securities, mm -hmm. which never happened. Mm -hmm. And Chase knew it never happened mm -hmm. because they had access to those accounts. Mm -hmm. The letters that were written, the internal memos of Chase, talked about this and talked about the lack of any of this, mm -hmm. which is what caused Chase in some degree to start to draw down the value of their account. Chase is being sued for $6.2 billion. Any other officers have individual accounts? Don't know. Okay. Haven't found out yet. The, the whole thing was uh, sealed. The lawsuit against J.P. Chase was sealed up until about two weeks ago. I'm in the process of reading it. It's about 170 pages long. I mean, the amount of reading to get through this to kind of talk to you about it has educated me. But there's just an enormous amount of material. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, to really grasp what happened here, to put this particular lecture together, as I said, required at least 500 pages of reading from multiple sources. Nobody else has done that. The story is pretty amazing that he got away with this. Yeah. You've got eight to ten people who are doing all of this stuff, all on their own. And it's amazing. Do remember that, uh, just one second, remember that one film I showed you earlier where Bernard Madoff was sitting around the campfire mm -hmm. talking about the fact that it was just impossible to trick people yeah. unless you could yeah. program the computers to, uh, <laughs> to perpetrate the fraud? That's just what he did. Yeah. That's exactly what the two programmers did. <laughs> With that Chase Bank, there must be a, uh, an officer who is mission with getting that uh, trading activity going between the Madoff account and Chase Bank, and they get paid for that, just like they get paid for all the other houses. And this guy was not performing on that particular account, although Chase was seeing all this money swim back and forth. So you know, the question is, that officer who was within Chase Bank, who was supposed to tap that account and get get Chase's share of that cash flow going up and down, which could have been massive. It could have been many times what, what was going in and out to the investors. There was an opportunity there. Why didn't his boss and his boss's boss say, what's going on here? We should be getting a slice of this action. Sure. And uh, we're not getting it. We're getting it from every other brokerage house. Why are we not getting it from these people? Plausible deniability. When I go through the investigations of the SEC with you, yes you're going to see a bit about people simply not doing their job. To some degree, the people at the SEC were negligent and incompetent. The people at the S at places like J.P. Morgan and the theater fund simply had blinders on. They were making too much money out of this. J.P. Morgan, in addition to the $300 million in investment profits they had through their IA theater fund accounts, had hundreds of millions of dollars in fees that were generated by the activity through the 703 account. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of dollars. How many times do you have to read articles in the Wall Street Journal about some of these insider trades that occur time in and time out where people know that what they're doing isn't exactly kosher and they keep doing it anyway because they're making too much money to stop? The argument that the trustee is making is J.P. Morgan was making a fortune on this and they should have known, which is why they're being sued for $6.2 billion and not 300 million. Yeah. Anyway, for those of you who have read the book, you talked about it. Tough to read, huh? Oh, very. Yeah. Um, just really upsetting. Mm -hmm. Which book? Our book. <laughs> okay. Stories of the victims. Twenty-nine Madoff investors wrote their personal story in here, including my mom and I. And I would really like each of you 
at some point during the course of these lectures to take this home with you and just read through a couple of them to get some flavor. I'd like to get some feedback from you as to what you thought. You don't have to read them all. Okay. But just pick one or two. Well, two anyway, so you can get some flavor for what happened here. You can't stop them, Michael. Once you start, you've got to read it all. <laughs> well, the stories are all the same, yeah. and they're all different. Yeah, so right. the impact on people's lives is dramatic. Yes. And the failures of our government, the yeah. abject failures of our government to protect us from these kind of things is nothing short of, of astonishing. Mm -hmm. And the failures of our government to follow through on correcting their errors mm -hmm. is nothing short of astonishing. The lack of access, the lack of concern. I told you about Mike Fitzpatrick when we started this thing. I told you he's coming. He wants to meet with me 30 minutes before the class to be brought up to speed. What do I tell him in 30 minutes? What do I tell him? I tell him, support House Bill 757. Put your name on it. You don't have to read it. Just support it. That's <laughs> well, good enough. Read it. Trust me. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> but I look at some of this stuff, and I say, the securities market is fraught with these kind of herbs. Yes. The protections that we have by our regulators is absolute nonsense. It's not any different today. Mary Shapiro has not fixed the problems. The Dodd-Frank spill has not fixed the problems. They're going to continue. And you know, if I had money to invest, I'd not be investing in the market. I just don't. Um, I really worry about, as if people like you, if there were 100,000 people in this class, what would you think about how, how transparent our markets really are? What would you really think about the idea of whether you can go to any investment advisor and have any degree of faith that the paperwork you're getting is real? And if it isn't, do you really believe that CIPIC is going to treat you any differently than they treated us? They are doing everything they can not to make those payments. And as I mentioned to you last week, Wall Street would have been better off putting up $5.5 billion to make every payment on SIPIC to every one of the Madoff investors and have them shut up. They would have been better off because I wouldn't be up here. Probably. <laughs> I might still be up here because I, I think you have to know. I think you have to know what happened here. I, I think you have to know how incompetent the SEC is and just how much they are being duped by the professionals in the industry that in many cases were former SEC employees themselves. Mm -hmm. I think you have to know. I mean, there should be some kind of restrictions for SEC employees using the SEC as a doorway into private industry to make money. There is no reason for SEC employees to annoy people in the industry when that's their employer two years from now. It's, it's nonsense. Um, and unfortunately, our legislators don't want to listen to these stories. They just don't. There's only a few. Garrett's one. It was a sort of a new guy for us. Pat Murphy was another one. Pat Murphy, he listened to he us. Listened, he listened. But he didn't really know what happened here. He really <laughs> didn't. The only people, there's probably only three legislators that really know what happened. The rest is lip service. And how do I get them to sit down and really listen to it? I can't invite them to the class. They won't come. <laughs> they think 30 minutes will do the trick. It's not they won't come anyway. We had to chase them. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Anyway. Well, you know, the, the revolts in Egypt and in uh, the, the northern Africa, <coughs> you know, the major purpose of government is to keep the sheep happy so once a year they get sheared and they go away and, and come back another year later and get sheared again. You know, so the you're expecting the government to do something other than try to keep the sheep happy so they won't get, the shepherd won't get slaughtered. The, the point that there's 600, 700 trillion dollars of securities, trillion, floating around, uh, most of it not going through markets. And the, the, the thing of trying to uh, regulate something that hasn't even gotten through a marketplace where the bid and ask is struck in, 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 sure. in that, you know, is, is colossal. And we're all hoping that this house of cards stays up there. Uh, because if it falls, it's the Soviet Union debacle. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. But I differentiate between the off-the-books companies that start, the current pink sheets or the less than pink sheets, and the relative safety and security and confidence that we would have by trading stocks on the NYSE and the NASDAQ. I would have thought that if you traded big board stocks or NASDAQ stocks, 
that the potential for fraud was not only limited, but was virtually non-existent. Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that you had insider traders who maybe executed three minutes sooner than you did and made an extra 25 cents on the share, it never occurred to me that a company would be able to generate all these fictional statements for two decades with literally several hundred thousand customers and it wouldn't be picked up. Well, it's I, astonishing. I met a corporate officer of three New York Stock Exchange listed companies and uh, we have this thing called the mushroom treatment, which is you, know, you keep the mushrooms in the dark and you feed them what mushrooms <laughs> you actually like. And, and you know, what happens, of course, is it's, it's awful hard to justify corporate jets. And it's awful hard to justify the largesse that happens once you get to the corner office. And it's all part of this enormous thing of I got behind good luck getting yours. And it, it's a good top of the whole economy by virtue of this. You know? yeah, absolutely. I mean, $65 billion is, is kind of a toppling thing. Mm -hmm. um, $65 billion. Who sealed the story on the Chase Bank? Who? Yeah. I'm sorry, who, who was released that? it? J.P. Morgan was um, was one of the roughly 1,000 lawsuits filed by the trustee Irvin Picard back in November, December of 2010. He was trying to work out a separate deal with them to provide some number back. They were being sued for 6.2 billion. Chase would not work out the deal, and because of that, the lawsuit was unsealed. I just got my hands on it about two weeks ago. The same thing is true of the New York Mets owners that their lawsuit was likewise sealed and was only open when the trustee could not negotiate a settlement with them. Of the roughly 1,000 lawsuits that are filed, I think there's about 20 that were sealed. Two have now been unsealed. And I haven't had time to really read a lot of them. Is it a WikiLeaks? So where do you find Can you find them on the web? Sure. Go to Madoff.com. Okay. Madoff.com is now being controlled by the, uh, by the trustee. Oh, Under that, wrong place. Under that, um, that location, Madoff.com, on the left-hand side, you'll see court filings on the left-hand side that files every court filing filed by the trustee since December 12th of 2008. Uh -huh. And there are pages and pages and pages of them. Some major lawsuits, some simply responses. Yeah. From my perspective, if I, had my, if I have my account at Merrill Lynch, do you see Merrill Lynch as equatable, or any big broker, uh, Vanguard, as any different than a Madoff situation where they're in investment advisors? Do you, do you equate the risk? I consider the them to be similar. Mm -hmm. Can you why? Well, Merrill Lynch is a large trading firm that has both a proprietor and market maker business. They can execute trades for you. They have a proprietary trading system. They do their own house trades. They have an investment advisory business where they have managed accounts for clients who are willing to pay the fees. That is exactly what Bernard Madoff Investment Securities did. No difference. Bernard Madoff Investment Securities at one point was larger in terms of trading volume than pretty much any single firm out there. As I mentioned, they were trading 15% of the daily NASDAQ yeah. volume, a trillion dollars a year. They were bigger than Vanguard, bigger than Fidelity, bigger than American Funds in terms of trading volume. 400 employees sitting up there. Yeah. More employees than many of the not so much mutual fund companies, but the big trading platforms that were out there. If you go into, in the very first week, I mentioned to you that I went into the local Yellow Pages and looked at the best <coughs> advisors in the Doylestown area and found, I think the number was 27. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any one of those 27 would be soliciting your business to manage your money for you. The size of BLMIS dwarfed every one of those 27 accounts that I found. They were huge. They were a giant. And they had a reputation on Wall Street that was virtually unparalleled with someone not like a Merrill Lynch where CEOs come and go, and not where investment managers kind of come and go and are higher guns going to the next, the next firm that willing to pay them more, but an investment advisor, Bernard Madoff, with a 30, 40 year track record of managing money. Mm 